Ihr Kreisky. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren äh, und alle anderen auch an den digitalen Endgeräten. Äh, dieser Abend oder diese Veranstaltung aus Kreiskis Wohnzimmer werden wir auf Englisch führen. That's the reason I start to talk in my bad Austrian English and say hello to everybody who is joining us here uh, in Kreiskis Wohnzimmer from Bruno Kreiskis living room. Uh, is this Syria in, in our Kreisky Forum here in Vienna. And I have a wonderful guest today, uh, Justin Guest. Justin, wonderful that you are here again. It's my pleasure, anytime. Justin Guest is uh, not only a guest in Kreisky Forum, he is, we can also say, uh, already a friend of Kreisky Forum because we had him already one time here and this is the second time. Um, Justin Guest is Associate Professor of Policy and Government at George Mason University, it's in Arlington, it's Washington DC more or less, and he teaches there at the Shaw School. I hope I did it uh, the right Perfect. way. And the first time um, we had um, uh, Justin here, we, he t we talked with him about his uh, wonderful book, The New Minority, about the white working class in especially the US, US and in Great Britain where he did a uh, uh, wonderful fieldwork also um, about this feeling of alienation, not being seen, not having a, a political representation anymore. Some parts of the white working class have. And now we talk about his uh, recent book. It's called Majority Minority. It's about migration. What does what migration does to the societies and what it does, especially if there's a huge, let's call it a huge demographic change. Um, uh, and for sure, we, we all know that this is a very, a very uh, pressuring uh, issue in the US, in Europe, also in some other countries. There is not only the phenomenon, but also the very uh, a, a political debate. Uh, with fear mongering and so on. So why did you uh, name your book Majority Minority? Because I assume it's not only because we think uh, uh, there's migration, people coming to a country, they assimilate, it takes some time and then they are part of a new of the old we. Uh, you were looking at countries where uh, the majority changed or native people from the countries or the autochthon uh, citizenship has the impression at least uh, that uh, the majority change in their country. Is this right? So thank you, Robert. Uh, let me just start by thanking you again uh, for, for hosting me and for your interest in my work. Uh, it's an honor always uh, to, to visit the Kreisky Forum. Um, yes, this book is about how societies respond to demographic change. And not just small demographic change, but great demographic change. Um, <clears throat> in many ways, you know, the book was inspired um, as a sort of follow-up to my earlier research on white working class people, um, the would-be Trump voters or Brexit supporters, far-right voters across the European continent today. Um, one of the things that I always uh, noted when I was in the field was this anxiety, a sense of discomfort as it relates to demographic change, when people recognize that their neighborhoods, their country uh, is changing. Um, and in some cases, you know, it's, it's mediated. They're reading about it in the news. They notice that the actors or actresses in, in films are different. Um, but in other cases, it's, it's direct experience. Uh, the people around them have changed. They're hearing different languages, smelling different foods, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that anxiety about demographic change is at this point ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's across the transatlantic space, no doubt. Um, but it's also in places like Japan and South Korea, uh, which are experiencing demographic change really for the first time in their history as they have opened up their countries more uh, to immigration in very small uh, but meaningful ways. So I think that the great fear, the sort of nightmare scenario for so many uh, Americans today, but also many Europeans, um, is this majority-minority milestone. And this re refers to the demographic milestone, the moment when a country ceases to have a majority ethnic or racial group, um, the moment when there is no group that, that sustains 
50% of the population. And this is a milestone that is first subject to constructions, you know, of how we create boundaries between ourselves. What makes a majority a majority? Because people who are in the majority today may not have been participating in the majority 50 or 100 years ago. Um, but it's also a, a matter of uh, awareness of, of numeracy, right? This is a very a milestone that's very far away for many countries. You know, the United States, it's anticipated to take place in 2044, 2045. Um, but in Europe, you know, there is no majority minority milestone expected any time in the foreseeable future. But the nationalism, the reaction, the politics, they're the same. And so I wanted to study these politics. I wanted to better understand how we can anticipate the reaction to great demographic change uh, in places like the United States with this immediate future ahead, um, but also um, uh, elsewhere uh, in the European continent and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about, about numbers uh, that people can understand. Sure. Is, this a fa is this a fantasy debate or is it, uh, what's the reality behind it? Uh, I think it's inspired because uh, the majority in the US in the moment, it's the traditional white uh, Americans. Uh, we can also talk, are they really traditional? Uh, but the traditional uh, uh, white Americans and they will be outnumbered by Hispanic population, or at least they are not the majority anymore. There are three big groups, the black American, the white Americans, and the Hispanic American. Is this right? Generally speaking, yeah. yes. So, so the way that the United States Census Bureau divides the population mm -hmm. is it first asks whether you are Hispanic or not, mm -hmm. and they call this ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And then they ask about race, and it's about white, black, Asian or Pacific Islander, Native American, and then they have another category they say other or don't know. And what we are really focusing on here from the census perspective is non-Hispanic white people. Mm -hmm. Because in the United States, you can be Hispanic, but also identify as white. And so really this idea of a majority mi minority milestone hinges on the demographic definitions. Mm -hmm. And it's a technical matter. And you know the first time that it was even created, um, it came out of a, a report from the U.S. Census Bureau, um, where they, you know, in a you know paragraph, you know, several down in, in this, you know, very boring report that generally only economists or demographers read, and um, and the media seized upon it, and they mm -hmm. said, you know, this is a huge milestone that's one generation away. Um, but what we're referring to is white non-Hispanic people in the United States mm -hmm. um, becoming less than fifty percent of the population by around twenty forty four, and the growth of African Americans, mm -hmm. Latinos, and Asian Americans, along with people who might be considered mixed race, mm -hmm. uh, people with more than with two or more racial backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, have, I, have, I put some look on the Austrian numbers. Um, I, I hope I can find them because we have the debate too, or at least the fantasy. Um, although people not really know what they are talking about, usually they think, uh, for example. Muslims, which are in the in the fantasy of uh, in the common fantasy, uh, the most foreign foreigners, um, uh, people would think they are thirty percent, forty percent. In fact, it's eight to it's between eight and nine percent. Um, but uh, if we put it in a broader sense, uh, the estimation is that in Austria in two thousand fifty, twenty five percent will of the population will be born uh, in another country. Mm. Um, this is 25% not born in Austria. It's not too much, but also, also it's a significant number. Uh, but in some districts of the country, it's, it's different. Uh, for example, in some uh, districts of Vienna, uh, there are already now more than 50% born in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. You will, will give a talk to this evening uh, in Favoriten in the 10th district at the uh, Central European University. Um, and in Favoriten, I think the, it's, the number is 51% uh, born outside of Austria. But this also means in Germany and France, but also in Turkey, Serbia, Ukraine uh, today. So this is the number in Austria. So that people, although it's not, it, although it's not a, a realistic assumption, uh, have the 
uh, imagination that the autochthon uh, Austrians will be in a minority very soon. Um, so what do you think? You, you, you looked a lot to the US, which has the idea of an immigration country, the, the traditional melting, point, uh, melting pot. We have other countries like in Sweden and also Germany uh, who have the imagination that to be Swedish or to be German is an ethnical concept. In Austria, it's something between because we were uh, already a melting pot 150 years ago. How do these imaginations a nation has about itself influence the adaptability to this uh, change? A nation is only existing in the imagination. You know, nations are something uh, that we construct. Uh, it, is, uh, it is subject to boundaries that are made by men and women and especially by leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, the understanding of what it means to be Swedish or German today is completely different from what it may have meant, you know, 200 years ago. Certainly Germany, you know, it was not federated. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a bunch of smaller provinces, basically, uh, subject to some self-governance. Uh, and. And, uh, and Sweden, of course, was part of Greater Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. So these things change over time as people develop what it means to say who we are. Mm -hmm. And that fundamental question is really what is behind uh, national politics, the politics of a nation, um, you know, is, the, is that concept of who we are. And I think that what immigrants do and what demographic change, racial and mm -hmm. ethnic demographic change creates uh, is the almost the obligation to reevaluate that, that, that question, which mm -hmm. is the who are we? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's terrifying mm -hmm. for many people, and it's understandable. Many people look at the nation as a rock, uh, as something that is static, uh, that while the rest of the world may change, some things are established, they're, they're concrete, they hold firm. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, what immigrants do is that they reveal the artificiality of the nation. Mm -hmm. When you ad admit people into your country, when you admit people into your nation, its composition changes and therefore the definition of who we are necessarily uh, evolves. But do you think there is no difference uh, in, this, uh, in this respect to a country or a nation like the US that from the beginning had the self-imagination uh, that it's a mixture of different cultures uh, as an immigration country and a country like Sweden, which has the imagin imagination of itself of uh, uh, ethno-religious homogeneity. There are differences and there are similarities. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, from the differences perspective, you're absolutely right. You know, the United States in some ways possesses an advantage mm -hmm. uh, because it's a country that has seen itself as always under construction, right? It, it, it was not born of at least, at least an explicit ethnic or racial identity, mm -hmm. even if it, I think it was implicit in many ways. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty inarguable at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you talk a little bit, of, because uh, the cultural homogeneity is by, by the imagination of the Anglo-Saxon white Americans as a leading, uh, part of the nation, am I right? Absolutely, yeah. you know, it was founded yeah. by Anglo-Saxons and mm -hmm. Anglo-Protestants, um, but not just Anglo-Protestants, mm -hmm. right? There were Catholic colonies in the United mm -hmm. States like Maryland and parts of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, there were different sects of Christianity that came, right? The, the, the United States in many ways was a refuge to the sort of rejected and the persecuted primarily from Europe uh, initially. Uh, and then, of course, hosted an enormous uh, African-American population born into slavery. And so, you know, the country has always been this mixed uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 mix of, of peoples. Um, but I think implicit in the construction of who the United States was, was this white racial identity that came with colonization. Um, nevertheless, the United States, over the course of the last mm -hmm. 200 years, you know, in, in recent memory for most Americans today, can recognize that Italians came, that Irish came, that Jews came, that Slavs came, that Greeks came, and, and then of course even more diversely beyond uh, Europe thereafter. They, were, they weren't seen as white and 150 they were, and they years were not. ago, and uh, then they were incorporated in, the, incorporated in the concept of whiteness. This is totally interesting. I found it in your book. Absolutely. No, my book discusses this uh, quite explicitly and, and, and extensively. Yeah, they weren't considered white. Uh, and, and to the extent that they were considered more white than others, 
they were still discriminated mm-hmm. against, you know, these white ethnic groups in the United States. They were excluded from social clubs, from public institutions, from universities, hospitals, charities. You know, they were excluded and discriminated against, so much so that they had to create their own institutions. And so, yes, the United States has this history, I think, of evolution, and Americans are cognizant of that change, that it's a country always under some construction. And that is a huge advantage. And the diversity of the United States is immense. And so that's also a big advantage. You can't easily subdivide the country into simple boundaries. It's, it's too complicated. However, I do think that sometimes we are, we are submitting ourselves and we're playing the same game when we think of European countries as somehow more static. Mm -hmm. when we think of them as somehow more established, as if Italy was always this one big country and not a collection of small trading city-states and provinces, you know, as as if Spain, you know, is it remains one big thing, which of course it's not. It has a variety of semi-autonomous regions, as if there wasn't migration uh, going to these places from other countries and other continents. You know, Europe has always been to some degree a crossroads Mm -hmm. of trade and, and also human mobility. And so I think that you know, I think we are always overestimating the extent that our nation is a finished product, both in the United States and abroad. Uh, I just think that it's more obvious in the United mm-hmm. States because not only of the immense amounts of diversity, but also the national story mm-hmm. itself recognizes, it acknowledges that diversity, it acknowledges that mm-hmm. change. Mm-hmm. Um, then as I'm, maybe you can talk a little bit also if, or, or about Austria. I'm, I'm not so sure if you studied too much about it, but it's also in, because we, it's a totally interesting uh, issue because we are now have now this debate to, to, in a total way. On the other hand, we also have this uh, history uh, of mixture from different cultures, which should assume that we are uh, m- more softly, we can more softly uh, a- adapt uh, to demographic change because we had it already, and we all have the have the uh, experience that this music uh, coming from the east uh, be part uh, of, after some years or some decades um, of the Austrian nation. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is true for many European mm-hmm. countries. It's not just Austria. I mean, mm-hmm. Austria as a sort of colonial, excuse me, not a colonial, as an imperial center mm-hmm. um, was a crossroads, of course, for the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which certainly you know shook up uh, demographically uh, its residents. But many of this sort of just blends in over time. And again, everyone is so conscious uh, uh, to actually join the mm-hmm. nation mm-hmm. that they actually r- perpetuate these myths that the nation doesn't change and that the nation uh, doesn't evolve. And, and I think that that's true, you know, generally throughout Central and Western Europe. Um, and I think then the next question is, what does the state do? Because one of the principal findings from this book is that demographic change uh, and the politics of demographic change is not subject to sort of uncontrollable mm-hmm. prejudice and, and racism. Obviously, racism and, and prejudice, these are major factors and they're vexing scourges ac- across different countries. But even the societies that I study that have experienced a lot of demographic change and navigated it successfully, those societies have, have done so despite a lot of prejudice that mm-hmm. endures. It never really goes away. Mm-hmm. The nationalism doesn't really fade away. It really is about strategy and it's also about Uh, narratives. You know, it's about policy and strategy, about how you actually uh, address and confront Mm -hmm. this demographic change in order to evolve Mm -hmm. as a country successfully. Mm -hmm. But uh, one central um, issue of your book, or uh, some central word, uh, is uh, the backlash. Uh, Also in history, in the countries or communities you're studying, uh, that they adopt in the one way, they deal with the issue, they make some ways forward, but then there's also backlash. And now we see in the US, in Europe, a kind of backlash against migration. Uh, migration. Uh, maybe not against migration in general, but a backlash maybe against some migrant groups or a backlash against uh, with this issue, uh, with this uh, frame it's it, it's going too uh, too fast we, we would ex- also the right wing would say we we would accept and we accept we know uh, we are a multicultural society but it's going too fast um, 
What's the issue of, of backlash? Well, it's it's inevitable. So you know, uh, it's inevitable. Inevitable. To, to backlash is inevitable. It's inevitable. Because, because, to, for what reason? Well, let's take a step back. So you know, in this book, I study six different mm -hmm. societies that encounter this majority minority milestone mm -hmm. because the United States will not be the first country to do so. Mm -hmm. And what I see across these six societies is a very clear path that mm -hmm. they all take. The first is the industrialization of the British Empire in this case, but really the industrialization of the world. Um, the second is to compensate the importation of labor. And that's, of course, the beginning the, mm -hmm. of, of migration and, and human mobility. The third is segregation and the segmentation of labor markets. Mm -hmm. Once all countries pass through this, they all face a big choice. Mm -hmm. Equality for the minority groups or no equality. Do they get equal treatment? Do they get to vote? Do they have any power or not? Once you pass this choice, a second choice they all confront, and that is, who are we? Mm -hmm. Is the national identity the same, mm -hmm. and you're ignoring the contributions or the arrival of different people, or do you redefine who we are, maintaining the sense of heritage, but also adapting mm -hmm. for the newcomers who are arriving uh, to strengthen the society in that way? All countries face these two questions, but all countries, and even if they behave in different ways, all countries also face backlash. Mm -hmm. There is a sense that this is too much. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm only studying countries that actually are experiencing a majority-minority milestone. And, so, and they are also very tiny countries. They're small countries. Yeah, they're small all countries. islands which yeah. have fragile demographies. But in many ways, I think of these, these countries as almost like a, a, a microcosm, a mm -hmm. laboratory of human instincts. So it's uh, f only for our audience, it's Singapore, Bahrain, uh, Hawaii, and, and, and other uh, Right, so it's Singapore and Bahrain, which mm -hmm. are two autocracies uh, that uh, confront the demographic change with suppression. Mm -hmm. You have Mauritius and Trinidad and Tobago, mm -hmm. which are, are countries that it, it, it arrive at the sort of equality of groups, but have, but have excluded them. And so they have a lot of contestation. And then last, we have New York and we have Hawaii. And I study New York and Hawaii in their earlier forms, not as, as, uh, as contemporary American states, but Hawaii as a kingdom. It was once a monarchy. And, uh, and New York as a state, but as a state that had immigration authority, which it no longer has. And so, you know, and, and those are two places that really redefined who they were with immigration. Um, so yes, those are the six societies, and they all encounter backlash. Even Hawaii, which, you know, adapted very well, they all experience prejudice and backlash. Mm -hmm. And you know, to your question about why, why is this so persistent? Um, it's a sense of threat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the sense of uh, of change, and people fear change that they don't understand, and they fear uncertainty uh, that uh, that comes with it. And so, uh, and in many cases, people feel unconsulted when mm -hmm. the change is taking place. They don't feel like they have a sense of control over the change. And nothing makes you feel more out of control than pace. Mm -hmm. When the pace of change is fast, uh, it feels like you have absolutely no control, no time to adapt. And, and that is when people, what do they do? They hit the brakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, the, uh, uh, this is why we see the arrival of greater nostalgia mm -hmm. uh, and why we see um, uh, the, the, the rise of more nationalism. It's a sense of trying to, to, to better understand and to assert control over an uncontrollable situation. So this uh, kind of political nativism uh, becomes powerful in the moment where it's over. <laughs> uh, where, by the where time you, can, you, you can, uh, cannot change anymore. By the time backlash takes place, yeah. the, the demographic change is already going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable because demographic change is not just about who has arrived, but it's also about fertility rates. Mm -hmm. And so what you see in places like the United States in particular is even if the United States were to, you know, shut the door and say no more immigration into the country, the majority minority milestone, that progress will continue more slowly, no question, but it will continue because uh, Latinos in particular are having more children than, than non-Hispanic white people are. And so that progress, you know, will, you know, grow exponentially mm -hmm. and, you know, non-Hispanic non white people will continue to diminish in their number, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, one, you know, decade by decade. Mm -hmm. So in, in many ways, um, the backlash arrives only when the change is visible 
uh, and it's too late to reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, this sounds a little bit optimistic uh, because uh, we can interpret what you said uh, in the way that, okay, the black backlash is in inevitable, uh, it will come, but this is a phase and it will be over. <laughs> sometimes, because it's a kind of mechanism of to adapt. Uh, is this a little bit too, too optimistic? It's too optimistic, because what happens is, yes, the, the, the demographic change passes, but the backlash may never go away. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's all about governance. Mm -hmm. So in certain societies, you know, like a Bahrain, for instance, or, or Singapore even, where I, you know, the two cases that I study, when you are suppressing the development of minority groups, it leads to a sense of angst and agitation inside mm -hmm. of them. And you basically have a two-tier society in many ways. Um, but then perhaps even more problematically mm -hmm. and more relevant for the, Europe, for the European continent mm -hmm. and the United States is Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. and Mauritius. Here you have minority groups that are recognized as equal but the two identity groups have not formulated a sense of who we are that is together sufficiently. And so they are always in this proxy battle with each other. The different political parties are ethnicized. You it's have, just like Switzerland. It's, it's, well, <laughs> I I mean, say, but it is closer <laughs> to the United States, yeah, actually, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, in the United States today, we have very heavily racialized political mm -hmm. parties. The Rep Republican Party is 85% or so uh, white, non-Hispanic white. Uh, and, and the majority of Latinos, the majority of African Americans, the majority of Asian Americans are in the Democratic Party by like a two to one ratio. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in many ways, um, you, you are starting to see this sort of racialization that is quite problematic mm -hmm. in a place like Trinidad and Tobago mm -hmm. happening in the United States. And what happens is that each political issue that passes by mm -hmm has this sort of existential quality to it because you're not just you know, arguing about one issue, it's a proxy for a greater existential fight over identity and culture. And that is, that is really bad news for any democracy. Do you think that uh, the things changed a little bit because not only of globalization, migration is, uh, and globalization are generally uh, uh, interconnected, but also with the newest forms, let's call it the newest forms of globalization, the globalization of the political debate. Uh, because I can imagine Bahrain and uh, uh, Mauritius and Trinidad de, ba de Bago, they dealt with their problems of, uh, of demographic change, uh, but were not influenced by a general global debate. But now we have this general global debate, uh, the, idea the right-wing Americans have uh, are coming like intercontinental rockets to Europe, influencing the, influencing the debate here. Uh, let's take this idea uh, or this fantasy or theory of great, great replacement, this right-wing terrorist idea, we can call it. It's in New Zealand, it's in Australia, it's in Austria, it's in the US. Um, does it become more difficult because uh, the internal internationalization of fear monger ring? So there's no doubt mm -hmm. that you have seen the diffusion mm -hmm. of politics yeah. and the diffusion of ideas. A conspiracy theory like replacement theory, like grand replacement, has definitely become diffused across the world. Um, and much of this is certainly thanks to the revolution in, in, in communications technology that has taken place over the last two decades. Mm -hmm. um, but Uh, even the cases that I studied were subject to the globalization of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, it may not have spread as, as quickly or as mm -hmm. easily as we see today, um, but in a place like Trinidad and Tobago or Mauritius, uh, Pan-Africanism uh, and, and, and Indian nationalism, uh, which were present you know, around the turn of the century and, and thereafter, were really influential in the construction of an Indo-Caribbean identity or an Afro-Caribbean identity. The idea of a sort of African Creole uh, was very conscious of things like Rastafarianism or, or, or back, the Back to Africa movement and African nationalism. And so, you know, there were global ideas at the time that these countries were wrestling with their sense of identity too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that today I think it feels more universal and the pace, the speed is incredibly quick. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, do we need something like, because you mentioned the word identity, do we need an, an idea of uh, identity? One can imagine we are so different, we are living in diverse uh, societies, for sure everybody is also an individual. Uh, do we need something like a common uh, uh, national or cultural identity? I think It's also conne connected with the question, uh, what is nationalism? Do we need nationalism? Don't we need nationalism? But we, do we need some kind of patriotism, uh, to, which means something we can be together proud about our society? I think we do. Mm. I think we do. I think that the, the evidence has become very clear that even in this very global world where you think you would see the sort of dissolution of boundaries, um, that actually globalization has produce the hardening, the reinforcement of some boundaries, um, precisely because I think there's a need. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a need to understand who we are and perhaps more importantly, what makes us special. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, human, human beings by our nature are, are looking for a sense of self-worth. Mm -hmm. And you know, for those of us who do not have a sense of self-worth that derives from our profession or from our sexuality or mm -hmm. from our um, family or, or, or heritage in some kind of way, um, the nation mm -hmm. can actually give us a sense of membership and it can give us a sense of distinction um, separate from mm -hmm. others. And I think that's what's coming very clear now. And, mm -hmm. and if you look at um, where you know, and who is finding the most self-worth mm -hmm. in the nation itself, in this nationalist trend, it, it tends to be a lot of people who have lost a sense of professional distinction, mm -hmm. who have lost a sense of stability in working class roles, um, and who have lost a lot of uh, income stability in many cases as well from those from that work, uh, as it's turned more precarious mm -hmm. uh, into this sort of gig economy. Um, and this is really in many ways where my work kind of overlaps and or sort of holds mm -hmm. hands with each other, mm -hmm. because the white working class people who I studied in my 2016 book, The New Minority, um, these are precisely the people who are the most susceptible mm -hmm. to nationalism because I think they're the ones who also uh, are looking or they're yearning for a sense of identity um, because they cannot identify with a global identity or a pan-European identity. They feel either excluded from it uh, or priced out. And so for them, many, in many ways, the nation has replaced uh, the union. The mm -hmm. nation has replaced the machinist or, or the class, factory. Or class. Or class. The, cla the concept of class uh, where you can could be proud of. Uh, that are the alienia alienations of the uh, white working class that was central for the nation 40 years ago and now has the impression it is on the fringes, for sure. That's the issue of your last book. But when, if we also talk about the alienations of the, uh, of the people who migrate to our societies, and maybe this is really a difference between Austria and or Germany and the US, because if they migrate to the US, it takes some time, but as after that it's very easy for them to say, I am American. Uh, but if I talk to some people, to people uh, from migrant communities here, and also from to kids who were born here, mm. and not only kids from the uh, uh, the underclass or the lower classes, P kids, kids who are well educated, they are already in the high school. Um, uh, if I talk to them, they say, I will never be an Austrian. I will never be accepted as an Austrian. This will, won't be my homeland in this, in German Heimat has a m little bit more <laughs> uh, pathetic, uh, uh, sound like uh, like homeland uh, this uh, I will uh, this will I will not accept it here as my homeland so um, uh, do you think this is really a, how can we solve this problem because it it takes too long if uh, we are talking about these examples are uh, the parents of them came here 30 40 years ago they are now 16 they were raised here and they cannot really imagine to be part of this nation. Although if they have the citizenship and they're going to university already. Yeah, there's only one way. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way is to broaden mm -hmm. the sense of who we are. Mm -hmm. Because don't forget, 
uh, while there are immigrants who, of course, I've spent much of my career studying as well, um, who feel this sense of exclusion, who feel this sense of being on the outside to the nation, um, in some cases in the second or maybe even third generation, which is a terrible disappointment, um, you also have native-born Austrians, native-born Germans, native-born British, uh, who feel like they are uh, suddenly strangers mm -hmm. in the only country that they know. Mm -hmm. And so there's this sort of mutual sense of alienation, a mutual sense of, of vulnerability that they're both feeling, um, and, and yet they're almost competing mm -hmm. for the sense of vulnerability about who has it worse, um, because both are struggling right now. Uh, immigrants feeling uh, very much on the outside, and, and even if they are actually socioeconomically perhaps on the mm -hmm. ascendant. Um, and then, of course, the native-born who are disoriented and, and, and discomforted um, in their countries. Both are in the countries, the only country that they've ever known. Uh, and, 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 this is the, and this is the sort of mm -hmm. um, uh, paradox at the core of all this. But the only way to address it is to think and to strategize how we broaden the sense of who we are to recognize that with reverence uh, the heritage of the country um, so that we're honoring you know, the, the, the sort of history of, of, of what the country was and the families that have been here a long time, but also to recognize um, the evolution of the country and to recognize the immigrant as not a threat to the nation, but actually the greatest hope for its sustainability into the future. After all, you know, Austria and, and, and Germany and Spain and all these other countries we're talking about, they're aging. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you age this quickly, um, it creates all kinds of problems. You have fiscal imbalances. You have too many pensioners for the amount of people who are entering the workforce. Um, you, a nation loses its sense of vibra vibrancy and, and innovation uh, when you age in this kind of way. And so immigrants for many European countries are actually the only way that the nations will survive sufficiently. And so I think that altering how we view immigration, not as this sort of you know, sense of charity and humanitarianism, or as the sense of like economic transaction, you know, quid pro quo, um, but actually recognizing immigration and persuading others to recognize it as, as, as a fight for a nation's survival, uh, I think is the only way forward. And then suddenly, the immigrant who feels excluded and the white working class person who feels disoriented can become brothers. Mm -hmm. um, the, all, the, all these issues are totally paradox, so I'm also contradicting myself. So if, uh, when, if my last question sounded a little bit pessimistic, uh, uh, so just, just like a Dr. Doom question, um, the next one is quite optimistic because if I go with open eyes uh, to the, through my societies, um, I don't see the whites that uh, losing their homelands and losing their majority status and are anxious about this and the migrants who don't have a chance. Um, I see uh, a much broader spectrum of different people. Um, and there are for sure these white working class people who feel totally anxious and uh, see change uh, as, uh, as a down, uh, downward spiral for them because it is in reality. Um, and, uh, but not all, all of them are xenophobic. Mm. Uh, and I also see so many <laughs> people from the white native uh, uh, part of Austria, I'm one, <laughs> uh, who doesn't have a problem with that. And I see so many uh, people from the migrant communities uh, that are integrated good, that are nearly assimilated or they're living their way and we're living our way. There's some difference, but we're living in a wonderful uh, uh, way together without any conflicts. And the conflicts are with some street kids from the migrant underclass, but not with the most of the, of the, of the migrants. They, for themselves, have maybe uh, conflicts with, with the street kids. So I see this majority of the liberal whites and liberal whites <laughs> and uh, 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 the migrants that uh, do well and adapt well, isn't that the new majority already? 
Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of these debates are hinging on very monolithic mm -hmm. uh, understandings mm -hmm. of, of different communities, and, and, and we don't want to uh, reproduce these monoliths, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the greatest monoliths is the is, is the idea of who the nation is itself. Mm -hmm. You know, recently I, I just learned about this uh, French survey that mm -hmm. shows that if you ask uh, French people um, to go back to their grandparents' generation, so three three generations back, um, one third of all French people have uh, some foreign background mm -hmm. uh, within just just three generations. You know, very recent, uh, and, and and a third of the country can identify one grandparent from abroad. But then if they go back like four, I think, or maybe five generations, um, they actually find that only 5% of the entire population is 100% blood quantum French, right? And, and I've got to imagine that the results would be very similar uh, around Western Europe in, in, in general. Uh, and of course, we know that in the United States, it would be sort of, you know, a lot few, much fewer generations. Um, and so we are always reproducing these kinds of monolithic ideas, and, and we do so in the United States as well. But in the United States, the, 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 the generalization that we reproduce the most, I think, is this idea of whiteness. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just to kind of come full circle to where we started this conversation, white people in the United States are made up of a variety of white ethnic groups that were, event, that were initially excluded. So we are creating this idea that everyone who is white today was white initially, and that's mm -hmm. just completely false. Um, Italians, but is this a good is this a good news? I mean, to talk to do it in 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 the Austria, then we uh, we in Austria we white autochthon Austrian would it, uh, adopt the Serbs, the Croatians, the Ukrainians. Uh, then we have the major majority already still, and uh, and the excluded are the Turks. Right, and that's exactly the kind of problem, yeah. right? Is that when we sort of broaden the sense of whiteness, we do so at the expense of those who actually, are not actually, white enough. Actually, uh, uh, sorry, actually, in the actual debates, we also include already the Turks and the excluded are the Afghans and the Syrians. Okay, so <laughs> someone's going to lose. You yeah, know? someone and, has to lose. And this is the yeah. problem, right? Yeah. Because because we are hinging the sense of the nation on this racial understanding or ethnic understanding of who we are, right? It means that you, you do so at the expense of the group that is not white enough. Yeah. And so, you know, in the, in the turn of the 20th century in the United States, that was African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, right? And that's really been who has uh, continued to be um, subjugated or at least excluded to some degree today, right? But if you continue to broaden whiteness, that's fine, but you're going to continue to exclude. Mm -hmm. The trick here to avoid these paradoxes, to avoid these sort of traps, is to stop hinging the nation, the understanding of the nation, on ethnicity. It's to stop with the ethnic nationalism and to shift the understanding of who we are to something that is civic, mm -hmm. right? To civic ideas that, that transcend these ethnic differences. Mm -hmm. And the real critical factor here is what makes a country special civically? And, and that is what each country, I think, needs to ask itself, is that even as we diversify as nations, what civically, what ideas, what traditions hold us together and make us fundamentally different from each other. If you ask me what it is for the United States, I would have an answer. I, mean, I wouldn't have an answer if you asked me for no. Austria, but that is something that for Austrians to be asking themselves, is who are we civically, mm -hmm. rather than but, who we are But isn't the concept of, the, I can imagine what you mean with, uh, with uh, civically, uh, and on the other hand, the ethnicity. But isn't there something between, uh, like culture? Sure. As, absolutely, because but you know, culture is about meaning making. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that civically, you know, civic ideas, you know, can involve meaning making. It mm -hmm. involves traditions, and traditions have some kind of roots. There's no question. But if they can be accessed and 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 they can be inclusive to newcomers who can adopt those traditions, then they can be national too. And I think that's really the critical question before us. And before we get all swept up in the sort of imagination of mm -hmm. like, okay, let's redefine who we are, we have to also understand though that there is a group of people in every country uh, that I think is going to be by far and away the majority that sees no need to redefine who we are. And so what we're doing when we are shifting to a civic understanding, a civic nationalism, we're trying to invent something, but you're trying to invent something that is old. Mm -hmm. 
you're trying to basically use the ingredients, the materials from the past to show how they endure even as the population changes into the future. And you don't want to change too much or people cease to actually see the identity of who they were previously. And it feels like too much of a discontinuity. In other words, you have to meet people where they already are. Mm -hmm. uh, one central concept you have is connectivity. What does this mean? Connectivity is the sense of connection, this mm -hmm. sorts of sense of you know interaction between people that they that that they are somehow uh, connected to each other. The idea that when they look at their countrymen or their countrywomen, they can see themselves, and and I think that that is what's so critical for a sense of identity mm -hmm. is that you don't necessarily have to agree with one another on everything. You do not have to look into your past and see e equivalencies, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to feel that sense of connectivity that sense that your fate is tied to the, your, the fate of your countrymen. But this is su such a strong concept. I understood it maybe wrong, <laughs> but uh, I understood it that way, that also if you see the other as a kind of alien in the way that you don't see him as a t totally similar, uh, if you get connected to him, you start uh, seeing him in another way than with your prejudice. I'm not sure if I understand what you're saying. Uh, that if you are connected, if you have some daily connections mm. with people, that uh, prejudices are going, uh, diminishing very slow. Yeah, so this is the idea behind contact theory. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there is decent early evidence mm -hmm. uh, that this is happening, that when people have meaningful con contact with each other, that means they're not just buying something from each other, but they're actually working together. They're collaborating. You know, they they they're sharing. You know, their ideas. They're sharing their thoughts with each other. Um, you know, or they're romantically involved. When you have meaningful, intimate contact with someone else across a boundary, when both parties are on equal footing, and you're maybe chasing the same goal or something, that this has demonstrated early evidence of uh, reducing intolerance uh, and facilitating greater uh, senses of belonging and inclusion. And so, yeah, I think that the more um, interactions we have across boundaries, the better we are going to be. Um, but, you know, our societies remain quite segregated as well. So even if, uh, you know, ideologically, uh, we are creating different um, uh, understandings of identity, um, we're not helping ourselves when we are limiting the um, the extent to which we're actually meeting each other. Uh, to come to slowly to an end, uh, and it's also just not at the end of your book, you talk about uh, the power of rhetoric, that this is decisive if uh, uh, to to the issue that c uh, nations can adopt successfully or not. Uh, if you have a reasonable rhetoric from the top, from the political top, then it will be easier than if you have uh, um, unresponsible rhetoric. Now we see that unresponsible rhetoric is everywhere in the world uh, because of uh, this uh, right-wing populist, how you name it, uh, uh, nativist backlash. Uh, when rhetoric is the central thing, uh, don't we go in the dark uh, future because the rhetoric is so irresponsible in the moment? Well, in many ways, that your earlier question begs this one, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, okay, if you're going to recreate the identity, who are the creators, mm -hmm. right? Who is doing the creation? Uh, who is creating the boundaries between us? And, and this is precisely why rhetoric is so powerful. Um, it's those who have the biggest megaphone uh, are able to are the ones who create the boundaries, mm -hmm. and so you know because these boundaries are constructed, mm -hmm. uh, and so it it's natural mm -hmm. that we would see big differences when you have someone at the top who is invested in dissolving these boundaries and expanding the sense of who we are, uh, or if you have someone at the top who is motivated to divide and to segregate and to capitalize on people's distrust, um, and I think what we're beginning to find is that politics is not going to be our savior. Mm -hmm. That politicians 
are institutionally incentivized to, to divide us um, because that's how they win. The way you win in politics is to find issues that wedge a country in such a way that your side will win and you put your opponent on the weaker side. And so, in, and certainly it, it gets even worse where money becomes involved. Um, like in a, in a country like the United States where the campaign finance landscape is like the Wild West, um, you are incentivized to create disagreement uh, and to create conflict because it brings more money onto your side to actually fight against the threat of the other side. And so in many ways there are institutional rewards for politicians that continue to divide. And politicians naturally seize upon nationalism and division and distrust uh, as a way to mobilize voters and fearmonger, which is a, one of the greatest you know, emotions that drive people to, to, to go to the polls. And so um, it is natural that politics is probably not going to be at least the only answer. Uh, and this is why I think that we have to recognize the responsibility of civil society groups and also business, uh, the business community all of whom are invested in social stability. All of them are invested in a sense of greater inclusion and inclusivity in a nation. And if they are so invested, then they should be asking themselves how they can help shape uh, uh, the concept of who we are. And it's very simple to do. I mean, this may sound like it's really hard, um, but actually it's really simple. They simply need to ask themselves before they act, each, you know, whether it's government, civil society, or businesses, Ask these simple questions. Is the act that I'm about to do, is this going to reinforce social boundaries or dissolve them? So the, the citizens should tell the politicians, we are fed up that you are dividing us? Well, that's the way to change politics. The way to change politics is to make unity mm -hmm. greater than division. Right? The way to change politics is to create a sense of demand for political officials and candidates who are, who are invested in the unification of a diverse nation. Right? Um, but if that's not possible, because many times you know, people will tell you in, in polling that they wish we were more unified, but the problem is that this desire for more unity becomes subordinated to other issues like healthcare provision or foreign policy or the welfare state and pensions. You know, these things can, or climate change, these things take priority over national unity and so national unity falls by the wayside. But yeah, theoretically, you know, voters can demand uh, 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 public officials who are not trying to polarize their society any further. At least we found a powerful slogan maybe at the end. Um, we are fed up that you divide us. Uh, maybe it becomes famous in the next uh, decades. Stop dividing us is a very good... Stop dividing you know, us. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's very obvious when politicians are, are trying to divide. It's because it, you can tell when there are big issues like climate change or, or health care shortages, you know, or, or energy crises or a humanitarian crisis or foreign policy war. It's when a politician, you know, focuses on something you know, like homosexuality or like Muslims and Islamophobia, you know, or, you know, what, or other small issues that, you know, are social in nature when these big existential, um, you know, economic and, 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 and political crises are before us, you know what's going on. Everyone realizes what's happening. And so, you know, you could recognize the division when it happens. And so I'm, I'm expecting eventually there will be a new generation of mm -hmm. politicians that says, when my opponent is focusing on these politics that are divisive, he or she is distracting you from what's really important. Because ultimately, these divisions are weakening a country's ability to confront the challenges of our time. They're undercutting the solidarity that is required to face off against a threat like Vladimir Putin on the Eastern European landscape, a threat like climate change on the horizon of our oceans. You know, they are undercutting our ability to act in solidarity. And so really, uh, unity, I think, is the great social challenge that faces so many of these diversifying countries. Thank you, uh, Justin Guest, uh, for this talk in Kreisky's Wohnzimmer, in Bruno Kreisky's living room. Wonderful to have you here, to have you here again. The book uh, I mentioned uh, again is called Majority Minority. 
uh, only available in English till now. We hope uh, it, there will be a translation in the next years to come. Um, I can recommend this book to you uh, and thank you, danke Ihnen von den digitalen Endgeräten, uh, that, that you joined us. Uh, jetzt falle ich von der einen Sprache in die andere. Wunderbar, dass Sie uns zugehört haben. Wunderbar, Justin Guest, dass du wieder mal hier warst. Dankeschön. <laughs>